All right, so uh, next up is uh, Professor Per Byland, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced, um, who's going to give us a talk about uh, what causes prosperity. So over to you. So here we are. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where prosperity comes from and what that actually means. Uh, it's a, a weird concept that a lot of people really misunderstand uh, and that is quite frustrating for someone like me talk, uh, who is um, uh, researching and teaching on entrepreneurship and economics. Uh, I have had a lot of people at, who have tried to contradict me and try to debunk what I've said in other uh, situations and in, in debates on Twitter and, and whatnot else, <clears throat> saying that it's poverty that we have created through all kinds of, of institutions and uh, such things as uh, ownership and property. Um, and I think it's important to start by asking the right question because this is such a, a confusing um, topic and it, it affects and is uh, related to so many things that we take for granted sometimes and some things that we, are, uh, we don't really understand much about uh, and some things that requires quite a bit of expertise. So where do you start nowadays unless you start on Twitter, right? So I want to start with one of my tweets from a few years back where I simply asked uh, the right question or asked people to think about things in the right way. So I, I said, what causes poverty? Well, nothing. It's the original state. That's where we start out. That's the default. Uh, the real question is, where does prosperity come from? So my starting point is, uh, and the assumption is that, well, from the beginning, we really had nothing. We had ourselves, we had nature, but we didn't have any convenience. We didn't have any comfort. We didn't have health care. We didn't have any of these things. And all of these are actually created. So the, the big question is not why are some countries or some parts of the world poor or why are some people poor, but rather how come that some parts of the world and some people are so damn rich compared to uh, what people, or the situation people were in uh, a couple of centuries ago and compared to the situation most people or all people were in for most of human history. So we have to start by asking the real question, what, what is the cause of prosperity? Where does prosperity come from? And how come we have all this wealth? And one way of, of looking at it and illustrating it is to simply look at some of these uh, cities that have come from basically nowhere. And I think Hong Kong is a good one. You might have seen pictures of Shanghai and, and, and Chinese cities where you basically go from a river or nothing at all. And then 10 or 20 years later, you have lots of skyscrapers and things like that. Um, in those uh, examples, there are a whole lot of problems with those simply because, well, we're talking about a communist state. Uh, so it's it's hard to know what is simply uh, forced what is uh, due to commanding resources into one area rather than using them for to create good. Hong Kong is a little bit different. So Hong Kong started out basically a fishing village uh, and over the course of 100 years it went from practically a, just a couple of rocks to one of the finance centers of the world with uh, one of the richest uh, places in the world because they did something. Well, they, they had a lot of economic freedom, so they could create a lot of value. Well, and we're gonna look into what that actually means and, and, and what, what we mean by value and what we mean by prosperity overall. So when the starting point, I think, should be to talk about what is an economic good, because that's what we're creating. And, and it's not really about the stuff. So in the previous picture, um, looking at Hong Kong, it looks like we're, what we're dealing with is really skyscrapers and uh, concrete and creating things and creating um, buildings and uh, transportation and, and things like that. But it's not really about the stuff. The stuff is not valuable in itself, but it's rather how we use this stuff. So uh, one, one way of thinking about it and the way we do it in, in sound economics is to think of any economic good as the value that consumers get from using it. So it's really satisfying a want that consumers have. 
uh, and you doing that on their terms. So it's a subjective um, valuation of, of the good. So you can you can think of a good in terms of a toaster or whatever it is, but it's not having a, a, a piece of metal or plastic that we call a toaster that is of value. You buy it because you will use it for for certain things. So whether whether you will um, toast bread or you will heat up fish fingers or whatever it is in, in it, or maybe it's just beautiful to sit on your desk. That doesn't really matter. It's your use and the sort of feeling you get from and the experience you have from using the good itself that makes it valuable. So we have to start by simply stop thinking about the stuff itself because that's not really um, uh, where, where we want to be and that's not really what explains our wealth either. So still, this, it's the use of the stuff that creates the value. So we still need the stuff in order to produce those feelings of, of satisfaction in consumers. So we can't really transport ourselves without some stuff, say a car or an airplane or things like that. So we have to produce those in order for us to transport ourselves from point A to point B. And we everything we do in is called production is intended to be consumed. So we're always uh, aiming towards satisfying someone that consumers have, uh, whether it's our own or someone else. Um, and production always leads to consumption. It's never the other way around. Was some people strangely have claimed that we consume and then we produce, but it's really hard to say consume a, a piece of bread that you haven't baked yet. <clears throat> and we, of course, engage in the production of or the baking of bread in order to consume. It's not the other way around. What this means in a market setting, though, is that our ability to demand something is constituted by our supply. What this means is simply that because I am working in a business or because I'm selling things or because I'm making money in one way or the other, I'm gaining the purchasing power so that I can then demand things, that is, buy things, right? So um, it's, not sim it's, it's important to think of it uh, in that proper way, that the, the ability to demand something is the purchasing power that you have already earned by supplying value to the economy. And the, the, uh, the modern, modern market economy, it necessarily works like this, simply because we are so specialized in producing something that we probably are not going to consume ourselves. So for myself, for instance, I produce entrepreneurship and economics lectures. I do not consume those lectures. Uh, I would be bored to death if, if I did. Um, and um, instead, I use I I think I'm doing a pretty good job producing those lectures and 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 helping uh, people learn economics and learn entrepreneurship. And by doing that, they pay me uh, in dollars or or whatever. And by getting that payment, I then can demand what others produce, which would be well alcohol and food and and a place to live and power and what, what have you. All of these things are produced by other people who are in a similar situation, who are supplying things because then they can demand their own uh, goods and services that they can satisfy their own wants with, okay? So what entrepreneurs are in the business of doing is simply creating this stuff um, that are attempted to satisfy a consumer's wants in a market setting, right? So they are, trying to figure out how to produce something that consumers will value enough that they will buy it. And then, of course, the, the aim of entrepreneurs is to create a profit from doing this. So uh, the proper way of thinking about this is not, as most people go about it, starting a business because you want to produce a certain item, um, calculate what the cost of that item is, and then add your profit margin. Uh, that's sort of your price, and then you try to sell it. That's a great way of failing and, and losing money. What you should do is start with value itself. That is, if you are good at or want to produce a certain type of item uh, or a certain type of service, then what, what type of value does this have for consumers? And what consumers specifically would value this the most highly? And then from there, you try to figure out, okay, what is the price that they would be willing to pay for this service? so that it's, it's not too high, meaning that they will find it basically a bargain uh, to buy it. And that price, I mean, it's determined by the value that consumers see in what you're offering. 
And your job as an entrepreneur is to choose the cost. So you are really in business of first figuring out the value and the price of a good that you want want to or are able to sell, and then figure out how to how to produce this in one way or another, so that you get to the point where consumers satisfy that want, the value um, in their eyes, and there's money between the price and the cost, so that you earn a profit, and that's really the the calculus. So it's not really about figuring out the the value of of something and then you just go with it. So it's not really about the idea. It's about figuring out how to get there at the le least cost possible. Okay. So one one way of illustrating what entrepreneurs do uh, and how it is really about value is to look at this example from 1975, uh, which is the pet rock, which was a really a a, a big hit back then, but these are really smooth rocks and they're sold in the, in the box. So they're uh, intended to be pets, but they're great pets because you don't have to pick up after them. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to give them attention unless you want to and so forth. Uh, and it, of course, it's, a, it's a, sort of a joke. It's a, a something funny, uh, something that um, uh, people would buy to each other as a, as a joke. But still, it was a, a great idea because it does satisfy uh, a want among consumers that is entertainment. Right, and maybe some people would actually see the rock as a friend. Who knows? But it doesn't really matter. It's in, all in the eyes of the consumer, and that is the point. Right, and and the price charged for the pet rock needs to be lower than the value uh, that consumers get from it. And of course, in this case, the cost structure is pretty low. I mean, just pick up a rock from the ground, uh, put maybe some hay or what what have you, and put it in the box, and then ship it. So it's it's not really about the cost. It's not the cost itself that makes the value, which this example illustrates really clearly. Okay, so before we get further, we need to make a distinction here. So it's, many people think of entrepreneurship as have coming up with a great idea, and then you just basically get all the money that is out there because you had this great idea. Well, that's not really it. Entrepreneurship is not about the idea. So we need to distinguish between invention and innovation. Invention is the idea itself. It's a new technology, a new technique, or a new product, or, or what have you. But that doesn't mean anything in itself. Right? So you have to take this new idea to market and figure out how to position it so that consumers get that it is valuable, so that consumers find it valuable, and so that consumers are willing to buy it. And exactly who, what consumer, in what location, at what price, and things like that. So bringing this invention to the market and selling it uh, and doing it in the proper way, that is what we would term innovation. And I'm borrowing this from Schumpeter's uh, work from 1911. Um, but it's important to keep this uh, in mind because when we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're really talking about bringing it to market and we're not talking about coming up with the idea. The idea is important, but it's the implementation that matters. And that's what's really important. Okay, so entrepreneurship itself is based on uh, some kind of invention, some idea, a business model or, or a new technology or what have you, but it really is the innovation. So the innovation is what makes it valuable for someone. It's bringing it to the consumer and packaging it in a certain way or, or um, communicating it in a certain way. It's pricing it in a certain way. So some goods are valuable because the price is really high, for instance. Uh, so luxury goods would not be valued as much by consumers had the price been lower. So the price itself uh, is also a part of the complete experience that you're offering uh, as an entrepreneur uh, through uh, this innovation, bringing an idea or a product to market. So what entrepreneurs do is really have, they have to imagine what type of value consumers uh, would want uh, to satisfy, what value, what would be of value for consumers, and then set out to create it one way or the other. So there are examples of this uh, historically, um, and you might recognize these guys, Henry Ford and Steve Jobs. So uh, Henry Ford is a, well, I wish it would have been a quote, but apparently it is not, but it's, it's a, a great non-quote. Uh, and he said, he, well, he didn't say, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Of course, we know that Henry Ford did not produce faster horses. Uh, instead, he produced uh, automobiles. and why did he produce automobiles? Well, because he imagined that that would satisfy consumers better than what consumers thought would satisfy themselves better. So that's pretty important. Um, 
lesson. And the same thing with Steve Jobs here. He says that you, basically you shouldn't ask people what they want because people are sort of thinking inside the box. And very often they don't recognize what it is they want until you show it to them. And then you have to package it in a certain way. You have to communicate a message in a certain way. So advertising and pricing and warm, fuzzy feelings, what have you, need to be part of the package in order to make sure that consumers understand what value they would get out of it. So this, of course, makes it really, really hard for entrepreneurs. So, but since they are attempting to figure this stuff out that is new, just like the automobile with uh, Henry Ford, they are changing things. So entrepreneurs are really driving change in the economy and in society. So in, within production processes, there are entrepreneurs that are all over the place and they're creating adjustments to how production happens through different new types of production processes, new materials and so forth. They are changing um, how resources are used, what types of resources are used in different, proce uh, different processes and produ production of different uh, pr products and goods and so forth. And of course, what they're doing is creating new types of capital, which would be capital goods in terms of machinery and, and factories and, and things like that. And they increase throughput too. So they're, they're renewing what we're doing. They're building off of what we have and they're increasing efficiency. But the main point is that they are imagining new things and they're realizing these new things. And they're doing that in a, a process that overall the whole economy is le really leading towards consumption. And here entrepreneurs drive change by simply increasing the availability of, of the valued goods that are already there. So basically increasing the scale, but they're also facilitating new value. So they're creating these new products where whether it's the pet rock or an automobile or the iPhone or what have you. Um, this, this satisfy consumers in new ways, uh, which make them a whole lot better off. Uh, and they also drive social change uh, through, through, through changing our lives, changing our behavior and changing what types of jobs are available to us and so forth. All right, so how does it drive change? Well, one is simply create a destruction by in innovating a new type of good or service that changes how we do things, that changes our behavior. I mean, we, we have recent examples would be the smartphone. Um, when everybody had a flip phone or even before when no one had a cell phone, uh, the world looked very differently. But with the smartphone, we could suddenly don't, do not need, for instance, a map when we're driving in a new place. We can simply use our smartphones and we don't have to uh, decide on a time and place in advance when we're meeting up with someone. We can just text them or we can just ping them in, in one way or the other through using our smartphones and so forth. So our behaviors change pretty much, pretty drastically. So this creates a different type of society. Uh, the wheel, of course, has had a tremendous impact on, on society and how we do things and transport things and, and so forth. Well, they also change the institutions of society. And a, a good example of that would be Uber. It's not simply competing with taxi the way taxi uh, was doing business, but instead launching a service that was similar to taxi, but outside of the regulatory framework. Uh, it basically positioning their service in a space where regulators were not. So they could um, get, uh, get that market, they could launch that service without having to bother with all these regulations. And they could beat taxi by, not si by simply not being taxi, which, is, which of course ch push, puts a lot of pressure on regulators, on policymakers. It push, puts a lot of pressure on incumbent businesses because they have to change too. So, this, of course, brings about a whole lot of changes. And uh, entrepreneurs also drive change through establishing transaction platforms. So the sharing economy would be one. We conduct business in different ways, more peer-to-peer -peer through an app or what have you. But this is really a, an older concept and an older phenomenon where the Sears catalog would be one where uh, people on the frontier, for instance, would be uh, dependent on that one store in the area, but with the Sears catalog, they could suddenly get in, in touch with numerous sellers and producers of a lot of different goods. So entrepreneurs, by creating new transaction platforms, make new types of products and services available for people, meaning that they are basically liberated from, from the limitations that they had before. Okay, so if we look at what entrepreneurship does, 
then it were in terms of economics, it innovates new combinations of factors. This could be any type of productive means, really. And they can facilitate the consumer value by offering new ways of, of satisfying those wants. Um, and by doing that, they, they change society, they change the economy and so forth. Now, they exercise judgment in dedicating uh, these resources to new goods. So Henry Ford um, exercised judgment in terms of imagining that people would be better off with an automobile than with faster horses. And he dedicated resources in order to make this happen. And he happened to be right, so he made a, a ton of money. But if you're wrong, then you're going to lose everything. So that's what that's what entrepreneurs do. Uh, that's the core of it. So so they have to have empathy with consumers. They have to figure out what is it that would pe make people's uh, lives better, and then imagine that type of good or service that they can produce that give, gives them this value that makes them better off. Okay, and of course they direct the factors that we already have. Um, so they 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 outbid entrepreneurs using resources in a different way. So they have figured out that, oh, I can probably use this location and these workers and these machines in a better way. I can use these uh, these materials in a better way if I produce automobiles instead of producing carriages and stables and, and so forth. Okay, so entrepreneurship fails though. And why does it fail? Well, it fails, fails for one simple reason. And, and I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So here is um, the Betamax uh, versus the VHS. Um, the video cassette uh, player. And this is an example, of course, but the Beta Max was generally considered to be the better technology, um, a better in innovation or invention, if you will, uh, it, much more effective and could, you, you could store more on one Beta Max cassette than you could on a VHS and, and whatever else. They still lost. Why did they lose? Because people found more value in the VHS, even though it was the subpar uh, technology. Here, another example, uh, the smartphone, which we automatically would think of as the iPhone, uh, released in 2007. Well, you had the Pocket PC and Windows Mobile from almost a decade before the iPhone. Um, people don't really re remember this because it was not really a big success. Why was it not a big success? It seems like it should be pretty similar. Um, well, because they positioned it in the wrong way. They didn't speak to consumers in the right way. Maybe the timing was off, whatever it was. But they, consumers liked the iPhone a whole lot better than the Pocket PC and Windows Mobile, even though it was uh, much sooner, uh, much earlier, uh, offering the same type of gadget, the same type of technology. So it's not really about the technology. It's not really about the stuff. It's not really about the thing. Instead, it is about the innovation. That is how you package things, how you uh, present things, how you communicate it, and how you bring it to market. So why do entrepreneurs fail? Well, they fail um, by simply having the improper innovation, not bringing it to market in a way that actually benefits consumers, that consumers make consumers better off. And entrepreneurs themselves, the, sing the individual entrepreneurs starting a business, would fail by simply choosing too high costs. So the cost structure would be the wrong one. So think, for instance, the, uh, the pet rock, uh, where uh, instead of picking up whatever rocks on the beach or wherever you found them, uh, he would buy specialty rocks that were really expensive. Well, that would be choosing the wrong, the wrong cost structure because he could probably not charge a price high enough to cover those costs. So it's, it's the wrong way of producing that value, meaning society loses, but the entrepreneur himself loses too. And of course, board, both of these uh, failures are avoidable by having the proper business model, meaning simply the innovation, that if you position your uh, product, your service uh, in a better way, uh, thinking of the consumer first uh, and satisfying consumer wants first and then figuring out how to do that in the best way possible, then you can avoid failure and then you will add to our prosperity by simply satisfying people's wants, making people's lives better, more comfortable, more convenient, what have you. So the question then, of course, is where are cryptocurrencies and will they succeed? Well, I would claim that cryptocurrencies, the invention is there, but is the innovation there? So that's where cryptocurrencies are probably failing or at least haven't succeeded quite, a, quite enough just yet. 
so the question is, how do we solve that problem if we want uh, cryptocurrencies to be successful? So I'll stop there with that question. Thank you. All right, excellent presentation. So uh, any questions for uh, Professor Per Byland? Questions about, so I, I have a question. I saw um, a tweet actually that said, uh, success with a startup is less about intellect and more about will. Would you agree or what do you think? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I probably, I would not put it in terms of will. Uh, so uh, you could use many different words. I mean, you could have empathy, uh, judgment, innovation, and things like that, but it's not a ma matter of, of will other than, well, I mean, sometimes you can be poorly positioned with respect to what consumers would actually value, but you're the only one. And if you just push long enough, maybe you will find enough consumers to cover your costs. Who knows, right? But but that's the wrong way of go, going about it, I would say. The, the better way of going about it is to start with the consumers and figure out what it is that they actually value and not push forward uh, at high cost, trying to figure out um, how to cut the costs would be what, what you're doing then, right? In order to stay alive. Uh, but if, if you as a startup are, are, are basing um, what you're doing on will and trying to cut costs, you started out with the wrong cost structure. So you, 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 did, it, you did it wrong to begin with. You need to do it right. And that's a very costly way of starting a business to do something wrong and then try to correct it. So you should do it right uh, to begin with. So, uh, and part of that is to be in, intelligent about it and try to figure out in, intellectually what would satisfy people. But it's as much about understanding people and empathy. Excellent. Um, another question: uh, the work of uh, Hernando de Soto on uh, the informal economy in the developing world. Um, do you find that relevant? Um, you know, say, you know, someone who would like to see greater prosperity in the developing world, you know, what, what are your thoughts uh, relative to his work or how relevant do you find it to be? I think it's very relevant. Um, I mean, his, his big work is the, the, the book, Mystery of Capital, um, where he, well, he, he basically talked with a, a lot of pe poor people in, in, in poor countries, asking them why, why, trying to figure out about why, how come you cannot grow your businesses? How come you cannot take yourselves out of poverty? Because we started out poor as a, as a, this, a species. Uh, so obviously someone pulled themselves out of poverty somehow and pulled a whole lot of more other people out of poverty and we, we did it ourselves. So what he found was that they are very entrepreneurial. They have uh, a lot of um, resources. They have businesses and all kinds of stuff, but they can't expand those businesses, right? So that's what, what you're asking. Uh, uh, he found that the reason they can't is because they can't go to a bank uh, to get a loan because there is no one, no one showing uh, that they are actually the owners of their house because there, there is no, no uh, central um, record of who owns that piece of land uh, or those cows or whatever it might be, right? Those, so, so in that sense, it's not actual capital. You can't use it to leverage for leverage and you can't use it as collateral when getting a loan, which means you can't expand your business, which means you're basically stuck, right? So um, that's where, uh, some, some kind of technology could make this happen without the state. I think DeSoto fo focused on having the state involved uh, because the state does not reach these people and does not really have a, a, a centralized uh, record of these poor areas, who owns what. But you could use a technology uh, to, to uh, uh, follow up on who owns what and then follow up on who trades what with whom. 
So you can do use that do that in a, a, a decentralized manner. And of course, you can use a, a ledger system or, or whatnot else uh, to follow up on, on these properties, right? So it's um, it's an area where technology can do a whole lot to help these people. The question then, of course, is not only do you do you provide value to them, but it's also do you make any money off of it, of creating the system? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you certainly gave us a lot to uh, think about. Uh, we really appreciate your talk. Uh, really was a great, great pleasure and honor to have you with us here today. Um, thanks again, Professor Perb Island. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.